Hey, good morning, good morning, good morning. I want you to know the average age in this room just dropped by 15 years this Sunday. And we're excited that we have got our college students back. I love that as full as we are in this room, there are still open seats on the front row, okay? I love it. Uh, But you guys are welcome to move up here if you want to. Hey, I want you to know, though, listen, okay? College students are a vital part of the body of Christ at Northridge Christian Church, okay? You are not visitors You are part of the church, and so what we hope for you, okay, is that eventually you will make the decision to get plugged into community here, that you'll serve in this place, that you'll contribute in a variety of ways. You probably saw a whole bunch of people that were helping seat people. We would love to bring you onto that team so that you can help other college students find a seat. There are ministry opportunities all across this campus. If you want to find out more about ways that you can get involved, Uh, Just head straight out these doors after the service. There's a room called Starting Point, and somebody can give you some instructions and some ideas on how you can get involved there. Hey, let me catch you up if you are just jumping in with us, because we're in the middle of a series called Everyday Conversations with God. And the idea behind this series is that 2,000 years ago, Jesus' disciples, they, they came to Jesus and they said, Jesus, will you teach us to pray? And Jesus isn't disappointed in their ignorance. Okay? He doesn't scold them. He doesn't tell them to just pray harder or pray more often. He teaches them to pray differently. You see, these guys, they wanted to know, how do you talk to someone you can't physically see or hear? What kinds of things does the God of the universe want to discuss with his creation? And what kind of posture do we bring to those conversations? And Jesus says, I'm going to give you a pattern of prayer that you can follow and incorporate into all of your everyday conversations with God. Last week we talked about adoration or praise. That's why we made these boxes up here at the front, because people wrote down their their descriptors of God. They praised Him on paper, and we filled up these boxes. See, we acknowledged that prayer begins by remembering and honoring the God that we're talking to. But today we're turning our attention to another pattern of prayer, and the pattern is called confession. This is what Jesus says in Matthew 6, 12, in the Lord's Prayer. He says, and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Forgive us our debts. Why? Because we have fallen short. We have messed up. We have sinned against our God, and in doing so, We've accumulated a spiritual debt that separates us from Him. Let's make this concept of spiritual debt practical by talking first about financial debt. According to Ramsey Solutions, the total personal debt in the U.S. is at an all-time high. It's currently at $17.5 trillion. Did you hear that? Trillion dollars. That means the average American debt per U.S. adult is $66,772. Now, here's the thing. That number doesn't mean very much to us. That statistic doesn't stress anybody out because it's a, it's a generalization, right? It's, it's a summary of the problem, but it's not going to trigger our hearts. It's not going to stress anybody out until it becomes personal to us. So let's try and make it personal, make some people uncomfortable. Let's start with credit card debt. Eight out of ten adults in America own at least one credit card, and 48% of them carry a balance on the cards they do have. That means the average person, the average adult, has $6,501 in credit card debt. Anybody want to play a game of over-under? Okay. No, we do not. Okay. The fastest growing debt in America is, you'll be surprised to hear this, student loan debt. Student loan debt which is at $1.6 trillion. It makes up 9% of the country's total debt. And each borrower owes an average of $38,290. Isn't that great? That feels pretty personal to some of you, doesn't it? Man, a lot of young adults, they're claiming that they're putting off important life decisions like investing in retirement, buying a home, and even getting married because of the student loan debt that they carry. Next is auto loan debt. 
Auto loan debt in this country is valued at $1.6 trillion. About 35% of U.S. households have this kind of debt, and they owe an average of $36,357 per household. The average monthly car payment on a new car is $738. On a used car, it's $532. That's feeling pretty real and personal to some people in the room, isn't it? And last major source of debt in America is mortgage debt, which at $12.25 trillion accounts for 70% of all American debt. For most people, this is the biggest category in their budget by far. They're paying an average every single month of $2,006.24. 84 million outstanding mortgages in our country, and the average balance of those debts is $145,833. No, I'm sorry, I just messed that up. $145,833. Man, is this conversation feeling real for anybody? Is it making anybody uneasy? Because you're making it personal and you're thinking through your debt and how it compares to everybody else's. Listen, I want you to know that we're offering Financial Peace University here at the church starting a week from Wednesday. And now would be a great time to sign up if you feel uneasy in your heart. You can scan the QR code in the seat pocket in front of you and get some more information. But the second and most important reason that I'm talking about this is because I want to emphasize just how heavy debt can feel when it becomes personal to us. Listen, in the exact same way, Jesus encourages us in Matthew 6, 12 to recognize that you and I, every single one of us, we carry a crippling amount of debt into our relationship with God. Not just collectively as a group, but individually. We have personal spiritual debt that weighs more than all of our financial debt combined. Because every single one of us has fallen short. Every single one of us has missed the mark. And every single one of us deserves to be separated from God because of the choices that we have made. Which is why today's conversation is so important. Because today we're talking about spiritual debt. But we're also talking about forgiveness. And the power of confession. If you got your Bibles or your Bible apps, go ahead and open up to 1 John chapter 1. 1 John chapter 1. This letter was written towards the end of the first century. And it's important to know as we jump in that it's addressed to believers in the church who have been misled in their thinking about Jesus. And what John says towards the end of chapter 1 and in the beginning of chapter 2, it lines up and correlates with what Jesus says in this section of the Lord's Prayer so well. This is what John says in 1 John chapter 1, verses 8 through 10. He says, If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins, and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar, and his word is not in us. Listen, we are sinful, but what he says right here is he is faithful. See, if we confess our sins, if we cling to his sacrifice, if we humble ourselves in his presence, God promises that he will forgive us and purify us from all unrighteousness. That's important to remember that, that John is not writing to people who have never heard the gospel before. He's not writing to a group of people that are just discovering their sinful nature for the very first time. John is writing to Christians like you and me. Christians that follow Jesus but still wrestle with sin in their lives. Why is this important? Because I think one of the biggest mistakes we've made in the church is to define spiritual maturity as the need to confess less. You see, the assumption is, as I grow in my walk with Christ, as I grow closer and closer to Him, I will confess less Because I will have less to confess. But the truth is, spiritual maturity claims the exact opposite. Because true spiritual maturity is like like an archaeological dig that discovers layer after layer after layer of what's been in our heart all along. 
True spiritual maturity is it's the constant realization that our sinful nature, it continues to rack up and build a debt that we will never be able to pay off apart from the love and the grace and the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. See, here's the first important truth that we're going to pull out of this text. Maturity, spiritual maturity, it increases confession. Maturity increases Confession. The farther we go in our spiritual walk, the more confession will dominate our prayer lives. Why? Because the more experience we have with Jesus, the more awareness we will have about our own spiritual debt. Think about it like this. Okay, I spent some time on Friday at Southside Tire. Okay, had lots of problems, had to deal with a lot of things, had a great experience. But I got to listen to some of the people that were in there talking about things that I didn't understand at all. Okay, anybody ever been there before? Okay, I want you to imagine that you were to go into that place or some other shop and you were to, to volunteer. You're going to say, I want, I want a job. I want to start working today. And on that first day, you probably don't bring a lot of competency to that position, do you? I mean, on that first day, you don't know anything more than I knew yesterday. You could probably diagnose like low oil or low tire pressure, just the basic stuff, but not anything else. But after 100 days at that place, you could probably begin to diagnose bigger problems, right? I mean, somebody could describe to you what's going wrong with their vehicle, and in your mind, you start thinking, well, it's probably this, and I know if I look here, this is what I'll probably find to prove that I'm right. But after 20 years, 20 years of working in one place like that, you'll probably be able to hear exactly what's wrong the minute somebody's car pulls on the lot. Why? Because your experience helps you dive deeper into problems than an instruction manual can possibly take you. Listen, in the exact same way, a person who is new to Christianity cannot, will not, and should not have the same level of awareness of the spiritual depravity that lives inside of them as those of us that have been Christians for a long time. Let me tell you what that means, okay? If you are just, just stepping into this whole Christianity thing, I mean, you're just curious about it. You, you haven't made the leap into a relationship with him, but somebody invited you to come with them, or you just kind of wanted to see what this whole church thing was all about. Here's all I need you to understand. You have things in your life that grieve the heart of God. You have made rebellious choices in your life, sometimes without even realizing it, that separates you from him. But if you'll turn away from those things, and if you'll turn towards the love of Jesus displayed on the cross, that debt will be wiped clean and you will be made new. And let's talk after the service. Let's get you baptized and let's launch you into a relationship with Jesus. But we're not done. See, if you're one of the 117 people that have got baptized at Northridge Christian Church this calendar year, okay? 117 as of today, because we got one at the end of the service, and you've just surrendered your life to Jesus, it's important for you to understand that your baptism was a starting point and not a finish line. You see, those rebellious choices that we make, they don't just magically go away because we surrender our life to Jesus. Now's the time for you to take a next step. Begin to name those things one by one and invite God to come into your life and loosen their grip on you once and for all. What that means is there will be more confession in your life, not less. But we're not done yet. For those of you that have been a Christian for a long time, let me remind you that you have not arrived at perfection yet. You see, your daily walk with Jesus, it should uncover the depths of your own personal brand of fallenness. We all have a next step to take, and you, as a longtime Christ follower, should be digging deeper for yours than anybody else in the church. Why? Because your experience with Jesus can and should increase your awareness of the sin in your life. There should be more confession as we grow in our walk with Jesus, not less. You see, what the world does not need, this world does not need any more Christian graduates who believe they no longer need God's grace for the sin in their lives. 
What this world desperately needs is deep Christians who recognize the weight of their sin and they carry it to God every single day through prayer. Amen? Amen. Listen, regardless of where you are in your walk with Jesus, confessing our sins, even in a private moment to a God who already knows them, can be incredibly difficult, right? It can be vulnerable, it can be uncomfortable, but fortunately, John, in the very next verse, he reminds us why we can have confidence to take such a bold step. This is what he says in 1 John 2, 1. He says, my dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. You see, the thing is, the instinctive human response to sin is not confessing, right? The instinctive human response to sin is hiding. That's what Adam and Eve did all the way back in the book of Genesis. But all of that changes when we realize what Jesus has already done for us. You see, it's through his death on the cross that he became our advocate and he restored our standing with God. You see, God did not lower the standard of righteousness so that we could get in. Instead, he found a way to make us righteous through Jesus Christ, regardless of our resume. And now everything has changed. You see, sin is no longer an accusation, it's a diagnosis. It's a trip to the doctor where we describe our symptoms and find out there is a name for that. The name is sin. We are sinful people. But Jesus is the cure. And because of our faith in him, we don't have to fear any longer what we may discover or confess about ourselves. Because through the love of Jesus Christ, grace always wins. Here's the second truth we're going to pull out of this text today. Faith produces confession. Faith produces confession. It's how we overcome that hurdle of fear and make this a regular part of our lives. See, we don't take the step into confession out of obligation or fear. I'm not standing up here telling you, you've got to do this or else. Instead, we approach this idea of confession because we have faith that the God of the universe loves us unconditionally. Listen, I saw an article that illustrates this principle really well. Apparently, in 1993, there were two young boys, 10 years old, that participated in a brutal crime. Their stories, they were inconsistent, and the evidence was really strong, but still these boys, they adamantly argued that they did not have anything to do with what happened. Well, eventually, the questioning went on for so long that the parents got their son, one of the boys, and he said, I just want you to understand that no matter what happens, no matter what you've done, no matter what you confess, I want you to know that I will always love you. There's nothing you can say or do that will change that. And all of a sudden, in a remarkable turn, one of the boys, the boy that was being spoken to, he quietly and tearfully confessed to everything. You see, it wasn't the evidence, it wasn't the prosecutor, it wasn't even the guilt that was weighing on his conscience that drove him to a confession. It was the assurance of his parents' unconditional love that gave him the confidence to confess to everything. Listen, in Christianity, as Christians, we believe in grace. We proclaim it and we say, I know who Jesus is, I know what he's done, but confession is how we actually trust what we believe. It's our way of sinking our weight into it. Because the thing is, we would not confess if we didn't believe that God was good, but because we know that God is good, we can't hide now that we know he's willing to love us through whatever it is that we've done, and we can have the boldness to confess everything to him. Listen, this concept, it takes the sting out of confession, and all of a sudden, it's a joy to get these things off our chest, to present them to God, knowing that He's going to love us and accept us unconditionally. Listen, there's one more final truth about confession that John makes in this text, and it's found in chapter 2, verse 2. It says, He, meaning Jesus, is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of of the whole world. You see, what Jesus has to offer, it's not just for you and me, it's for the whole world. 
His grace, his love is not reserved for people who look like us or think like us or talk like us. He is not content until the whole world knows. And we shouldn't be either. He's not content until your entire school knows and we shouldn't be either. He's not content until the entire city knows and we shouldn't be either. You see, the Lord's Prayer, it links God's forgiveness to the forgiveness we show others. Why? Because Confession reminds us that we are all equal in our need for what only Jesus can provide. And now all of a sudden I can forgive them because Jesus has forgiven me. See, my debt was great, my sin was heavy, but because of what Jesus did for me on the cross, because of what he does in advocating for me every single day, I can love the world with the same unfiltered passion that he has shown to me. You see, the desperate need of our world today is not a church without sin. That's not what's going to change the world. The desperate need of our world today is a church without secrets. One that lets confession flow freely so that others can experience through us what Jesus has done for the world. Here's a third important truth we're going to pull out of this text. God uses confession. God uses confession. He uses honest confession from faith-filled believers to proclaim the good news of his great love to the world. Listen, I read an article recently about police in China. I don't know if they're still doing this or not, but they experimented with a new program where motorists can receive forgiveness for their moving violations and the fines that accompany them if they confess on social media. Okay? Isn't that crazy? The catch is it has to get 20 or more likes. Do you know how many tickets on Log Cabin by John Millage we would save ourselves? There would be nothing else on social media in Milledgeville. Well, listen, one driver, he wrote this. He says, I was seized by traffic police when driving my scooter in the wrong direction at an intersection. I have learned it was wrong after education by the traffic police officer. I would like to remind internet users to learn from my lesson and not to think it is okay to commit mistakes when driving a scooter. That's incredible, isn't it? Now, police emphasize that this is just for minor traffic violations. You can't kill somebody and confess online and and get away for free. But their obvious hope is that the confession of peers will point other people in the right direction. Why? Because confession is a powerful thing. And listen, within the context of the Christian community, it is so much more powerful than that. It can do so much more than deter traffic violations. You see, we often think that the world wants us to be perfect, and and we've got to have it all together because of our faith in Him. But what the world really needs to see is humble Christians who confess their sins before God and live with the faith that He loves us anyway. That's the kind of Christianity that's going to change the culture and ultimately the world. Maturity increases confession. Faith produces confession. And God uses confession. Here's our sermon and sentence today. Confession is a safe and necessary pattern of prayer. Plain and simple. Confession is a safe and necessary pattern of prayer. It is nobody's favorite topic. If we'd gone online this week and posted, hey, at Northridge Christian Church, we're going to be talking about and celebrating confession of sin, nobody would have said, yes, I can't wait to get there so that we can participate. Man, it's important. Because of who Jesus is, it's safe. So let me ask, do you have any unconfessed sin in your life? Do you have unconfessed sin in your life? Are you hiding from God? Are you for some reason afraid of how he's going to respond once you open up and reveal the truth? Then I want to encourage you, let this be the moment that the walls come down and we take this bold step together as a church. See in your seats when you came in, there's a green slip of paper, maybe on your seats, maybe in the seat pocket in front of you. Those of you that we had to throw chairs out for, work with your neighbors. Okay, we're going to get this thing worked out. But what we're going to do is, after I pray, we're going to throw a video up here, and it's just going to walk you through some scripture and some instructions. And ultimately what it's going to do is ask you to to confess your sins to God. Now, what we're not asking you to do is to write your name on this. Okay, you're not going to have to stand up and defend it. That's not how this works. Just fold it up and hold on to it. 
and spend a quiet moment praying through those things with God. And on your way out today, we're going to collect them, and we're going to continue to fill these boxes with the prayers that we're offering throughout this, this series. I want to encourage you, read the words on the screen, engage in the instructions. Let this be the moment, maybe for the very first time, that you get vulnerable and honest before your God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we acknowledge that we are sinful people. Every single one of us, nobody is exempt, and God, that personal spiritual debt, it, it weighs us down. We know the, the weight of it because we know that it separates us from you. It grieves your heart. It, it ruins any possibility we have of eternity but God, we celebrate the fact that 2,000 years ago, Jesus came and died on the cross in our place, taking the weight of that sin, taking the weight of all the choices that we've made on himself so that we could be forgiven. We could be made right with you again. So God, in this moment, we, we just simply express our gratitude. And we offer these things up to you unfiltered. God, we offer these things up to you right now because we know that you're good and we know that you'll do what you've promised to do. You're going to love us. You're going to forgive us. You're going to give us a second and a third and a fourth chance. So I pray over the next few moments, even if it's the first time somebody's been this vulnerable and honest with you, God, wrap your arms around them. Let them feel the freedom that comes from running to you in the midst of all the choices that they've made and trusting that you love them.